like I had a sense of pride working at the company. You know, it's like, yeah, I work for Tesla. Hell yeah, this is freaking cool. And I also own part of the company. And, so, and I know that if I work harder <laughs> and I and I do some good stuff for the company, that's it's going to make it better and more profitable, which means that the stock's going to go up a little bit more, which we all win and I get a little bit more of that. For some of us, Tesla stock will play a large part in our goals towards financial freedom. In this video, I speak with Farzad Mespahi to share his personal story on how he achieved financial freedom with Tesla stock. Many of us follow Farzad's YouTube channel to hear his unique perspectives as a former Tesla employee. We've got a chance to meet earlier this year in Gigafactory, Texas, during Gigafest back in April. Uh, we got him to see Elon as well. We met in the, the paint shop. We took a photo, as you can see in the screen over here. Farzad, thank you for being on the channel. Thank you so much for having me, Darren. It's a pleasure. It's good to see you again. It's it's been a minute. Obviously, we last uh, first met in person at, at the Giga Factory. It was the one thing that stuck. And I literally just told you, you were the nicest person ever. I'm like, man, this person is so nice. <laughs> it's so easy to talk to. But thank you so much, man. Likewise, I really enjoy your channel. I think you do a great, great thing for the community, especially for for the people in Singapore. And um, I really enjoy your perspective. Your stuff is super solid. And yeah, man, thank you for having me on. I'm super excited to talk to you. Thank you. Farza, many people have watched a lot of your videos, so they know quite a fair bit about you, including your passion for music as well. Is there one thing that most people don't already know about you? Yes. <laughs> Which one? Uh, so this one's probably much lesser known. So I do I do have a pass passion for music, but I, I used to play clarinet for 15 years semi-professionally. So I was actually playing in pit orchestras, the clarinet. And I was like, okay, uh, I, don't, I don't even can't remember if I even said this on any of the videos, but... Uh, yeah, it's something that I used to do because I, I just had a natural inclination to music growing up, uh, especially in my teenage years. And in my head, I was like, I want to start learning clarinet because I want to impress girls. And then I found out girls are not really impressed by clarinet too much, you know, so I got to pick up guitar. And that's how I ended up with that stuff, you know, so that was like, <laughs> it's like, it's all for the girls, you know, but uh, that's one. I got a 2.7 GPA in college. I studied like 10 hours total. I was addicted to WoW, you know, World of Warcraft constantly until four o'clock in the morning, dude. What a disaster that was. I played a, a priest. His name was Farziness, which is also my Twitter handle. So that's like been my name. So if you want to go find some stupid shit I said, like, you know, 20 years ago on the Internet, you, you know, go find that. I'm sure, sure I'll be raging on like a gaming you know, forum or something. <laughs> so, but yeah, those are a couple of things. If any of you remember a, a priest in a while called Farziness, this is him. Yeah. And we've turned out OK. Yeah. We've turned out OK. I've yeah, I've yeah. so far anyway. Hours on it. So, WoW's been going on for a long time. Yeah, I, I used to play a rogue, mostly a rogue, a little bit of a warrior. Oh, yeah. Fun times. So that game's been going yeah. on a long time. It's crazy that WoW still exists today. They're still releasing expansions. People are still paying $15 a month. And this ties back to actually your own journey with Tesla. You've been in Tesla's journey for a long time as well. You worked in Tesla for four years, from 2017 to 2021. But then your journey actually began much earlier in 2012. How did it start? Yeah, man. Uh, honestly, it, it was mostly luck that I stumbled upon the company. So back in 2012, I was uh, om about almost three years removed from graduating college. So I graduated college in 2009, December. I was there for four and a half years. I graduated from Penn State University uh, in Pennsylvania with a degree in math. And it was right at, at the aftermath of the financial crisis in the United States. So I'm this, um, you know, newly graduated a guy with a math degree, not really sure what he wants to do. Terrible college student, obviously addicted to freaking games. Right. And, you know, uh, couldn't really find any jobs. And I, I finally was able to find something six months. And it just so happened that our neighbor, when I lived with my parents, she worked at this pet uh, food distributor. Um, and, uh, I, I was able to join that company. And then after a couple of years, I started to, you know, make, you know, I, I just try to work as hard as humanly possible. Cause I'm like, man, I have a hundred thousand dollars in college debt. You know, I, my, my family, immigrant family came to the States, you know, we, we, we didn't have, we didn't have a lot, but we had enough to scrape by. So it, it wasn't like, you know, like my mentality was, I got to make something, I got to make something like, I got to make something of myself. I got to make something happen on, uh, on myself. And so the equation started going through my head. It's like, okay, so even if I work at this company for say 40 years straight and I retire, the likelihood of me getting to a point where I call myself financially stable and be able to say, you know, have these grand goals of, you know, retiring all my family members and all this stuff, whatever, you know, whatever long-term goals I have become uh, significantly more difficult unless I'm able to somehow multiply my wealth, right? Especially with this debt that I'm saddled. 
So I started looking into investing, into investing in stocks. And uh, back in 2012, uh, I, I was doing a lot of research on what what to invest in. And that you know, the names that came up were Apple and Microsoft. You know, there was like some 3D 3D printing companies back then as well that were becoming really popular, Chasis and some other one. And then I also stumbled upon Tesla. Uh, I, honestly, by sheer luck, I, I was just kind of googling best stock you know to invest in or something. And then uh, I stumbled upon Tesla Motors Club which is a forum that's been around uh, since then. So people like Dave Lee, Ahmed Peppers, uh, I think James Stevenson, Stevenson was on there as well. I can't remember exactly, but Dave Lee and Ahmed Peppers, for those in the Tesla community, I'm sure are very familiar. Uh, they, they were regular posters. And Dave Lee was under the handle Dave T, and he would have these mega threads, these like ginormous posts on there, just outlining why Tesla was going to be extremely successful all the way back in 2012, 2013 timeframe. And after I started finding those forums, I'm like, man, this is super valuable data. Like, how come, how come I'm not seeing this sort of work for any other company, which kind of gave me the signal that said, okay, this is probably something I should throw a few bucks in. Right. And then once I threw a few bucks into it, I started researching the, the, you know, Elon Musk, who's this guy, Tesla Model S looks like a good, cool car. And then this rabbit hole of just, wow, this guy is very smart. He comes across very intelligent. He comes across very real. Why does he make so much sense? Why does, why does no one know about this? Like, this is crazy. And so my conviction started going up like crazy to the point that, uh, sometime in 2013, like almost hundred percent of my then net worth, which was in the negative, you know, it was like negative 80,000 or whatever, but whatever I had that was liquid was in the stock. And that was right at the time, just by sheer chance where the stock, uh, they posted their first profitable quarter. And they went from uh, 30 bucks a share to like 180 a share in the, in the span of a, of a few months. And then that allowed me to buy my first house, you know, like that literally allowed me to get a down payment and actually start, you know, making some moves in my life. And so um, Tesla for me has been, the, the, I, I owe so much to that journey, to be completely honest. It's made me into like who I am in a way. And it sounds corny and kind of like weird in, in a sense, but uh, unless I, I found that company and and sort of, uh, had the ability to find those incredible creators and Dave Lee and Emmett Peppers and really the entire Tesla Forums Club uh, uh, community, I I, w I wouldn't have been able to be where I'm at today. And I'm eternally grateful. And since then, it's just been, I've just been absorbing information like crazy and got to work at the company for four years. So it's almost like I'm this investor turned insider who got to find out so many things, but I did it because I, I was passionate about the mission. I'm like, literally, I it's, being invested, it wasn't enough for me. It's like, I'm, I want to work for the company and having done that gave me so many lessons and I was able to learn so much. And, uh, yeah, now I'm, I'm here in freaking YouTube talking to you and having a great conversation. <laughs> so yeah, it's been wild. It's been, it's been nuts. Elon says that fate loves irony and you talk about paying it forward people in the early days, like Dave Lee, Emmett Pepper is helping out. It's quite crazy in 2012, just 10 years ago. Apple was not even an investment grade stock yet. The credit rating was not investment grade. Here we are today with Farzad talking with Alexandra Mertz, Gary Black on getting Tesla to become the next investment grade credit rating stock. In all these years, back then you mentioned Dave Lee. Dave Lee mentioned he really started increasing his conviction in investing in Tesla after trying a Tesla Model S himself. Was there any particular moment that made you go, yes, I'm ready to go right now? Or do you try a Tesla product beforehand? I didn't try a Tesla product until 2015 because I bought my first Model S in 2016. So I, I, my conviction was from the ungodly amount of hours that I poured on the forums and on YouTube and on Google, just doing everything I can to find out more about this company. And, um, and then that initial run up, like you have to remember, like I'm 35 now, back then I was 25, 24. Uh, so, you know, I'm not this like well-formed, I, I would say adult that really understands the stock market. That's not my background. You know, I was just a guy who's trying to make, trying to make a life for himself, you know, trying to make something happen so I can live the life that the sort of the goals that I have. And then for me, the, seeing that initial run up kind of hit this light bulb for me that says, wow, if I find really, really great investments, I'm going to be able to change my life pretty drastically. Like it's kind of crazy how quickly it can change if you take the risk and you do the due diligence to get there. Once I got in the car in 2015, my conviction was already at an all time high, but all, I guess what it did is it sealed my, it sealed the conviction and said, yeah, this is it. Like you heard all about the car. 
the stocks, you know, did give you a lot of uh, ability to purchase uh, some real estate. And now you got into the car and, and everything became confirmed. So all the work that you did, all the hours you poured over uh, was for something because now you got into the freaking car. So that, that was definitely an important step. I think working at the company ultimately is what gave me the most confidence that um, this is a, a long term story that the last 10 years are really just the foundation for the next hundred almost, if you want to call it that way, just because of how uh, unique that experience was and the level of talent that's in there and how everybody's so on mission. And if it's not the, it's not the easiest place to work. It's not for everybody. And it's not a perfect place to work that no, no such thing exists, but boy, do the pros outweigh the cons. And if, if you want to be around in a company that really allows you to make things from scratch and really try to move the future forward, Tesla is an incredible way of harnessing that energy. So I think being part of that company is really what, um, uh, I guess ultimately really, truly, truly sealed my conviction on Tesla. The buying the car was like, was like a confirmation of the research. And then working at the company was the thing that took it to the next level and said, yep, yeah, it's not just going to be uh 10 years. It's going to be hundred years. So you took it one step further than most retail investors. Most of us would probably not be working <laughs> for Tesla. Some of us would want to one day. In all these years, there are moments of ups and downs. Even as you do the research and forums beforehand, getting a car, joining the company. Were there any major moments of doubts? Example, when Elon tweeted, funding secure. Or when you just joined a company and they had the Model 3 production ramp. And how do you overcome those major doubts? Yeah, that, that was super challenging. I think for me that the biggest challenge as an investor and really part of part of the Tesla story was that Model 3 ramp, especially being at the company at the same time, because, you know, you are at this company, you're already working your ass off as much as you can. And it's not an easy place to work, right? So a lot of days you go home with an L, you know, you got like what for those that don't understand what that means is you go home, you failed at fixing something that day because this stuff is so freaking hard. So you got to go home, <laughs> regroup and come back the next day. So it's already a very challenging place to work. Then you go home and you have family and friends sending you these news articles that are saying Elon Musk is a crazy person, you know, like the FUD years. Elon Musk is a crazy person. Tesla's going bankrupt. Tesla's a terrible, terrible place to work. They're going to go to zero. They're, all these competitors are coming. I mean, all of us that are part of this story kind of know this, right? Like the FUD years of it's, it really hasn't stopped. It's just the company is self-sufficient now. So who cares, right? Um, so that was very, 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 very challenging as, as a person being inside. But what was cool to see is that I think, you know, at least from the time I was there and the teams that I was surrounded with, they were very aware of the narrative that was going on outside of the company. And a, a gigantic majority of the people that I work with were uh, additionally inspired to make sure that this thing worked, that, that we proved all those people wrong. And so there was this sort of sense of just us against the world. At least I felt that way. I don't want to, I don't want to put that on, on other people. You know, I want to allow them to tell their story whenever they choose, if they ever choose, but that's how I felt. I felt like it was us against the world. It was Tesla against the world. We had a lot of doubters and, and we had this incredible community, this incredible community of fans and investors and people that were so passionate about the, the mission that, uh, were trying to push this thing forward. Like, Hey, like this is actually going to be incredible. It's going to be amazing. And I found a lot of, um, I find a, a lot of uh, strength from that myself, because when you're working really hard, even if it's not your own company, if, if, if your own business, if you're working for something you really believe in and you have a lot of noise that tells you that this is like, you're making a bad decision, unless that super organic, uh, uh, grassroots community was there really being thankful for the work that Tesla was doing and passionate about the product, I I probably would not have stayed there, to be completely honest, because it's it's so hard. It's freaking hard. You know, and this is not to like give myself pat myself in the back. It's just a hard place to work. You got a, a lot you have a lot of shit going on. So uh, that community is incredibly helpful. So like er, literally everybody watching this, myself, yourself, we're all part of the community. It's a big family. That that's for me was so incredibly helpful to help me get through that hump. And then once we got through that hump and those uh, profitable quarters started happening and Model 3 was ramped and Model Y became ramped and Cybertruck got announced and these new gigafactories started opening and the free cash was going crazy. Like, it's like, okay, 
so that was a lesson for me that said uh, you when you're facing really difficult times or when there's a lot of doubt around you, if you're really, really passionate about the mission and you feel like you've done all the diligence to ensure that this is for the good, then just do until it's no longer there or just keep going until you're ready to move on to the next step, right? Like you really at, at your limit, right? So um, that was that was very helpful for me to, to understand. It just gave me like a new insight into, hey, like things, things are hard. <laughs> things can be very hard, very, very hard. But um, if you surround yourself with the right people, then anything can be possible. And I think that's where Tesla sh shines. Is that just, they just have the best of the best. And yeah, they can get anything done. Diamonds are forged under extreme pressure and heat. And through those painful experiences, it gives long-term investors, employees like yourself, a lot more resilience. Majority of Tesla retail investors today probably came in in late 2019, in the good days, in the boom years during uh, the stock market run during COVID. Now, this year has been a bit tougher. What's one thing you wish most retail investors knew about Tesla? I think sometimes what happens is that folks think they have a long term horizon for their investments when they really don't. So uh, what I mean by that is, you know, say you're a person who has 10,000 bucks and you decide to put 5,000 bucks into Tesla. And you're like, no, I'm comfortable if this goes to zero, like I'm just going to put it in here and this is a long term investment and I'm going to be comfortable with it long term. And then once that 5000 turns into 2500, then human nature is to freak out. It's to say, what the hell just happened? I thought I was <laughs> why else would somebody invest their money in something unless they were confident it's going to go up when it goes down a bunch? They're going to be like, shit, I made the wrong decision, right? So and that becomes a test. That becomes a test for the individual that says, okay, are you actually invested into the company for the right reasons? So I think from my perspective is, you know, and I'm this is not investment advice. I'm not an expert. This is just how I've approached my investments, right? People have to be very, very comfortable with the fact that when they're investing into something long term, if they choose to invest long term, they have to be willing to really go through periods of 80% uh, losses, potentially. Who knows what can happen? if you're really invested long term. Um, so so just ask yourself that question constantly. Test your hypothesis. Go out and research things that are anti that that company. You know, like I wouldn't say Tesla Q because the problem with Tesla is that I feel like the, the bear case is sometimes not proposed correctly. Like there aren't any good bear cases out there that I at least I can found. I find, but who knows? I might be wrong, but that's my opinion. But like try, try to get yourself in a situation where you can test your hypothesis, you know? Um, and ultimately, I do think Tesla is a long term story. It's still to this day a long term story. Uh, I think sometimes what happens is when when a stock goes up a lot, you know, just the psychology of a stock going from 50 billion market cap or even $10 billion market cap to a trillion that people are like, OK, this went up a lot. It can't go up any higher. Right. But is that is that the case? <laughs> is that the case? What, what is what is what is mathematically? What is a, a law that exists that says there is a limit to how much a company can grow, right? Depending on what uh, addressable markets it can get into. Um, so, yeah, I, I would say from my perspective, if you're invested in Tesla, it is still a long term play. And a, a lot of companies are still going to be subject to anything that happens in the macro environment. And this is a perfect lesson for it. So unless you're willing to be in, in a company for five to ten years, then maybe adjust your exposure to the company to a place where you feel comfortable. And, and then if you do, if you feel that you're not comfortable with your investment, then I think that's the right time to ask, OK, am I in this company for the right reason? And and there's nothing wrong with being a, I'm not saying don't be a day trader, do whatever you want. Like, I'm not I'm not your dad. Do whatever you want. I'm not here to give you like tell you what to do. But if I were to give advice is just test your hypothesis and make sure you're in the company or invested in any company for the right reasons that are truly and honestly what you're trying to achieve personally. Um, and and ask yourself that question every day. And I think that will allow you to be properly invested in the right names at the right amount where you can actually feel happy and try to use your brain instead of it, you being stressed, you can use that brain towards something towards your future and building stuff or learning stuff, right? Because we all know like shitty days are a strain on your on your brain. It's it's tough to sit down and do good work if you're like worried about your money, right? So minimize that as much as you can and try to find ways on how to maximize that potential in the future by making yourself as comfortable as possible with your investments. Agree.
we don't want to be stressed for a full 10 year journey. As you mentioned, a lot of yeah. people will not believe you in the beginning. When you first started investing in Tesla and 20HL, most people would have laughed at you when you told them Tesla would deliver a million cars a year. Today, most people are going to laugh at you if you tell them Tesla will deliver 10 million cars a year. History may not repeat itself, but it rhymes. And even with companies at a long runway, when Steve Jobs left Apple or passed away in 2011, the stock price actually went up 14 times uh, since then. And that's in many people's perception without major innovations. There's the Apple Watch, there's a few things there, but nothing as profound as Tesla bought full self-driving or what's in store on the pipeline. And the people who are bringing this story to life long-term are employees. As you work there for four years, Tesla employees do have a 15% discount on Tesla stock. How much did that play a part in accelerating your path to financial freedom? It definitely helped. So, so the way the way the uh, this plan works for those that are not familiar, it's called the Employee Stock Purchase Program, and it's it's super common for any public uh, companies in the U.S. where you're allowed to put uh, up to a certain percentage of your salary or paycheck. In this case, for Tesla's fifteen percent, I don't think it's changed since I left. I I haven't been there for almost a year now, but pretty sure it's still the same. You can put up to fifteen percent of your paycheck into an escrow, uh, and every six months that escrow vests, and then they purchase Tesla stock at a fifteen percent discount at the lowest price of either the beginning period price or the ending period price. So you effectively get a fifteen percent discount at the lower of the two. Um, and so you know, if if you invested at the beginning and say you're putting fifteen percent of your paycheck. And then at the end of it, the stock is up, you know, uh, or the stock is down, say, you still get 15% off technically, right? So it's kind of like a 401k on steroids. That's the way I think about it. Uh, so it helped. It, it Really, the biggest thing it helped with is that it removed fifth, because I maxed, I maxed it out every every period. I did 15%. I, it it uh, reduced my ability to spend that stuff, that money on something stupid. <laughs> so that's sort of how it accelerated. It just, I, that's, that's how I operate. Like unless I hide money in places, I will figure out a way to spend it, you know. And that's something that I'm becoming better at, as especially now that I'm, you know, financially independent. I'm, I can't go out and blow my money because I'm screwed, right? Like I, I need unless I put sources of income in some place to sort of uh, get me to where I need to be. Um, so it, it definitely helped. It definitely helped, and I think it's a great perk, especially for a company like Tesla. That's, uh, in my opinion, still has a, in my opinion, still has a lot of long-term growth potential. And uh, yeah, it is. It, it's a very cool perk. It's a very very cool perk. Talking about employees, how do they see Tesla stock differently from normal retail investors? Is there a slightly different relationship mm. with Tesla stock for employees? I think so. So what I saw, um, I got the pleasure of leading some teams at Tesla. So I had uh, a few people that I that I that reported to me, and I was able to sort of, um, you know, help them achieve their goals. They, um, what I found from my experience is that when a employee is invested in a company and they're uh, not only through uh, a percentage of their compensation being in Tesla stock, but by giving them an incentive to invest in Tesla stock at a discount, it uh, creates an ownership culture in the company where you're not just a person that's there uh, as a nine to five, you know, just making the paycheck. You're This is your company. You have a, a small slice of the company and anybody can have a slice in the company. It's not just you know, usually it's, these things are usually reserved in private companies to like the executives and, you know, people that are willing to invest in the company, right? The investors and the board and stuff like that. Uh, public companies, it can be anybody. And, and a company like Tesla that's so mission oriented, you have this sort of double whammy of super passionate people working at the company who also own part of the company. So it creates this amazing ownership culture. And then with the way that Tesla incentivizes folks to really approach problems their own way, and really try to remove barriers when it comes to uh, folks getting to that point. You know, like politics are minimized. Anybody can talk to anybody. If you have a solution for something, like we try it. It can't be anybody. It can be the janitor or, or a warehouse worker or a director. Like if you have an idea, let's try it. Let's try it and it works. So you have this amazing sort of culture that appears. Um, and I think there's also a sense of pride. Like I had a sense of pride working at the company. You know, it's like, yeah, I work for Tesla. Hell yeah, this is freaking cool. And I also own part of the company. And, and I know that if I work harder <laughs> and, I, and I do some good stuff for the company, that's it's going to make it better and more profitable, which means that the stock's going to go up a little bit more, which we all win. And I get a little bit more of that, you know, from from that perspective. So, uh, but but what's also really cool about Tesla is that the, the retail investing community is so strong. It's so freaking strong that 
a lot of these folks are, you know, they know the story really well. You know, I, they don't need an employee or an ex-employee to come out and sort of um, tell them about their investments. I mean, there might be some hidden gems in there that somebody can can drop from working internally. But retail investors are also super well read on the company. It's just that additional sort of uh, variable of being there and being an owner of the company that you work at technically is an additional boost to ensuring that folks are uh, trying their absolute best to bring value. I think having a, a mission is so important. Remember this story in the 1960s when NASA was working so hard to put people on the moon and I think some government leaders went to visit the administration building, spoke with the janitor and asked the janitor what's your job here. The janitor said, my mission is to help put people on the moon. I do that by providing a clean workspace. Uh, we, we see that here in Singapore and Changi Airport as well. So when we talk, uh, they used to be my, my customer at work. And when I met the janitors, they, they said, this, well, I'm just cleaning the toilet. The airport was it's the first step that foreigners, tourists will see Singapore and the last step they will see Singapore. We want to have an amazing first and last impression. So I think that, that mission, and as you talked about, Joe Justice was on the channel. I got a chance to speak to him as well. It just almost gives a more level playing field from people from all walks of life to, to ever have a chance to succeed together and work on something together. That's yeah. important. You talked about the retail investor community, how it's so unique for Tesla. I wonder, I want to ask you, Apple, during Steve Jobs Day, a lot of people loved it. it a strong net promoter store, uh, products were amazing. Yet, Apple never had a retail investor community like Tesla. We had to go into YouTube channels, into forums, into so much. What is it that makes Tesla one of the most widely talked about, followed companies and stock? Dude, I have no idea. It's 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 such a crazy phenomenon. Like I have a hypothesis. I have multiple hypotheses, and I, I'm sure everybody <laughs> and yourself have have hypotheses about this. But I think, man, I really think it's a combination of the fact that Elon Musk is such a unique character and uh, appears to be somebody like one of the few folks that has a lot of money that is trying to do things for humanity in the most positive way possible. I think that's for some reason it's. It's not at least it's not visible. There could be fifty percent of the billionaires out there, millionaires out there, could be doing that. They just don't have that public persona. People don't see it. I think that him being that public persona for that, tied to a mission that is very grand and super inclusive of anybody, right? It's to, it's to move the world to a sustainable future. It's to have. It's to build these. Uh, incredible uh, things for humanity from a transportation and energy generation perspective. And now that with their hardcore focus on full self-driving, it's safety, like like reducing uh, lives being lost on the road and people dying driving with the bot is going to be freeing people up to do what they choose. Like these are insanely grand visions. And when you put this and you pair this with a person like Elon, who is so comes across as as honest, in my opinion, as he does, I think you have this killer combination. And then you layer on the fact that the stock itself has been performing so damn well for the last 10 years, if you really think about it. It's just been crushing it, going from 10 billion at IPO to 100, uh, to sorry, to a trillion dollars now, or was recently, it's around that level uh, these days. That That's just a combination of, it, it's a magnet for people that are, uh, passionate and want to move the world, fo world forward and want to be part of something special that's also going to help them achieve their goals financially. It's just, just sort of this weird uh, combination. And I think Elon and the Tesla team are very smart about um, really associating themselves and trying to build a culture with their community that really maximizes their relationship with them as well. Like the, their lack of investment in PR and their lack of investment in commercials and ads and marketing, I think these are very strategically minded because in their head, it's like, okay, so the best way to have a very, very strong community is to give them a reason to love it. And so that's a forcing function for us to create the best possible product and the best possible service and the best possible mission so that people are very, very passionate about what we do. It's, it's, a, it's a forcing function. If you have marketing and PR and you have these things, and I'm not saying they're bad, I'm just saying this is just what it appears to be their strategy. It's, it's a lever. It's a lever they've pulled that says, this is how we maximize our ability to build the best products. We, 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 we will not invest in telling a story. We're just going to make the damn thing. And if people love it, they will reward us by becoming super loyal. And 
it's working. <laughs> it's working really, really well. Um, but th that's my hypothesis. I'm, I'm curious. I don't know if you have you if you have one, but I, I think about that a lot. It's like for me, it's like what I just described and multiple other things. But what, what's yours? I want to build on what you said, Farzad. Tesla builds products that people love. He told MKBHD that the reason why they don't advertise is because in parties, people don't talk about what they like, they talk about what they love. But I see them having that similar with Apple. Apple users love their products as well. But I think one thing that goes beyond products that people love is because Tesla is disrupting so much, it generates a lot of enemies. And when there's more attacks, other people in the sidelines become curious. Mm -hmm. Why are people attacking Tesla so much? What's behind the scenes? What's the other perspective? It is almost like for every action as an equal and opposite reaction. And mm. because Tesla is so attacked that people almost like band together and say, let us support this underdog. Let us support this company that's trying to change. If so many people are hating on it, they may be doing something right. What is it? And I've never seen a company attack as much as Tesla. And I, I wonder if that has a, serves as a catalyst to bring people together as well. I agree with what you just said too, because that that's insightful, and I and I agree with that a lot. I think that's been super interesting to be part of that Tesla story, just from that, because you get exposure to just how dirty the world can be sometimes, like the sort of this like underlying sense of like I don't know if I call it corruption or what, but like there's this like firestorm of like that FUD storm thing I was talking about while I was at the company is a perfect example of this. It's like, like I'm here. I can see it with my own two eyes. This thing's working. How can you write this dude? Like every day I'm seeing this with my own two eyes and it's the opposite of what you're saying. So what's, what, what's the disconnect here? You know, I think, I think that's a very, um, that's very insightful and I, I'm willing to bet a lot of people uh, probably feel that way. It's like they, they, they feel like they have to come, they're almost compelled to support the company and really come out and fight that uh, FUD and fight the, the, the hate that comes from the other side because they feel like it's something worth fighting for because it's important, you know? Um, and I agree with that. I think I, I, I would have to be part of that camp too. I invest in and admire two companies. So I, I still invest in Apple and I admire Steve mm. Jobs, but Steve Jobs had a gift of making small things very big. He pulled out the device from his pocket, a thousand songs in your pocket. He pulls up a device from Manila Envelope, MacBook Air. He's great at making small things come across as very big. Elon Musk, on the other mm -hmm. hand, is someone who makes big things very small. Today, we don't even watch live streams of rockets landing back on a barge in the middle of the ocean anymore. But for the past eight years, no other company in the world, not even the most well-funded governments, have been able to build a reusable rocket. And so sometimes mm -hmm. the way Elon puts it in just very simple terms, Tesla, extending life on Earth, SpaceX, making us a multi-planetary species, is, it's a great mm -hmm. like, siren's call, it's a great call to action. And so I think that's very inspiring beyond just investing to achieve financial freedom, which is important. Mm -hmm. But life is about beyond that, as Elon mentioned, life is about beyond solving, breaking up and solving problems. Uh, we should have something that inspires us. And... Yeah. The way we live on things that inspires us is when we achieve financial freedom. And we have our own dreams on how it happens and how it plays out. My question for you is, how did your plans versus your reality for financial freedom play out? Dude, that's such a good question. I, I like, it's such a good question. Man, so in my head, like I, this whole financial freedom thing has been such a incredibly rewarding weird journey because it's completely rewired how i think about life period you know so back back before back when i was making the decision to actually let me go one even one step before that back before i was at a position where i made the decision to uh pursue my own passions because i felt like my wife and i were financially stable enough to do so i was like I, I had a number in mind. I was like, okay, I, I need this number, whatever, 50 million. I don't freaking know what the number was, but it was this gigantic. And I was like, oh my God, this number is like so big. I need to grind so hard and just make as much money as humanly possible because I want to have ultimate security. I want uh, literally 0% chance of any of this failing. And I want to do anything I want at any time because I want to have enough money to do that, right? And then what ended up happening is while I was, 
achieving, fortunately, I was achieving that wealth. I started like, you know, we, we did all these fancy vacations. I went, I was buying whatever I wanted all the time. I, I became almost, almost very materialistic. You know, I was like, uh, we had two Model S's at one point and either of us, like, like we barely drove it, you know, but if we had two Tesla Model S's, there were 75 D's, but it was still like, you know, $160,000, $80,000 in cars. And then, uh, you know, we, we went on these uh, fancy trips, which were amazing, super, super fun, you know, bought all this random crap. And then I, sort of the, um, that I guess there was an itch in me that said like, Hey, like being wealthy or being financially independent means being able to spend money on things that make you happy. But then I learned a very hard truth, which is things don't really make you happy. That's that was my lesson for me that this is not this doesn't apply to everybody, but this is just for me. What I learned is that things don't make you happy. And as soon as that and as soon as that realization came and I'm like, holy crap, like what I have doesn't really make me happy. It's my conversations with my wife. It's hanging out with my friends. It's taking a trip to like a, 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 a seldom visited place and being part of the culture. It's eating amazing food. It's cooking amazing food, you know. It's having conversations. It's having a freaking YouTube channel where I can talk to really smart people every single day and uh, have a community where we can sit down and figure out how the future unfolds. Like these are the things that make me happy. And once I reached that realization, I, I had a light bulb moment that said, "Okay, it's not about how much money you have. It's about what makes you happy. That that's the baseline. That's where everything starts. It's what makes you happy for me. Like again, not a financial advisor." But for me, that's what, what it what it helps, what, what really helped me to achieve it. And so then I sat down, I'm like, okay, what really makes me happy? I looked at it, I'm like, okay, so all the things that make me happy, they're not very expensive. Uh, I barely have to like spend any money on this stuff. And fortunately through that journey of, uh, uh, you know, investing in Tesla and having real estate and all that good stuff, we were able to pay off basically almost all the debt that was tied to that stuff. We have some debt for, for properties, but that's just part of our strategy. Um, and then I'm at the point like, okay, crap. So uh, if we leave now, um, and, and we sort of like carve our own path, you know, my wife, uh, is a, has a passion around photography. She used to be a DJ dude. Like she used to be a DJ and she's finally getting back into DJing. You know, I started a band and I have a YouTube channel and we have properties like we have, you know, we don't spend a lot of money and we already have sources of income. That's going to help us sort of support our, our lifestyle choices for what we want to do. And then some like, why not take the risk and go after it? And then I fought with that thought for a while, you know, because I think working at Tesla was a big like I was that was my identity. Like, I think to a fault, it's like, oh, I've been invested in Tesla for a really long time. I work at the company for four years. I'm doing really well at the company. I'm mentoring teams. I'm building up teams. We're freaking crushing it. We have, uh, you know, uh, our building is the best in the globe. Like we have the best metrics where all our processes get stolen. Like we have this rock star crew and we're doing everything incredibly well. But then I'm like, okay, but who am I? <laughs> who, who am I as a person? What makes me happy? You know? And so uh, making that decision on the, on that, on that sort of underlying foundation that said, it's not about how much money you have, but it's about what actually makes you happy. Like that is the first question you have to ask. That, uh, was a huge lesson for me. And the more I embark on this journey, the more I'm finding that less and less things actually make me like, it's, it's so crazy. It's not things. It has nothing to do with things. It's, it's experiences and it's truly creating things that make you, you as an individual happy. And for me, it's playing music. For me, it's creating good conversation. It's talking to people. It's getting to know people. It's getting to experience, uh, cultures it's, and it's spending time with my wife and family and friends. And there might be some cool gadgets here and there that I find interesting, but I'm not like, oh, I have to buy that. So that brings your, <laughs> your ability to go financially independent way down, way down. Right. So it's almost like, yeah. So that's what, what's worked for me. That's worked for me uh, so far really, really well. It could all crash and burn in about, uh, I don't know, 10 years time. And you could find me under a bridge somewhere like freaking <laughs> under a hole or something. But so far it's been great. And, uh, yeah. So once I figured that happiness question out, that changed everything for me. It really did. That is a powerful perspective. And you talked about how in the past, maybe a bit too much of life was defined by Tesla. Elon Musk gets compared a lot with Iron Man, Tony Stark. And I remember in the early days of the 
Marvel Universe. Jarvis was a system that was entirely dedicated to Tony Stark. Then he became like his own independent entity, Vision. He found his own life, his own mm. way. He got separated from that. And it's almost like your journey just going beyond that because Tesla is important. It's beautiful. It's a big place on earth, but it's not everything. Right. And as we achieve financial freedom, there are billionaires today who would be gladly willing to give off half their wealth for their youth. Because for most of us, we may achieve our financial freedom in our 40s or 50s. Your wife and yourself have the gift of achieving it in your 30s. What opportunities does this open up for both of you? I mean, everything, right? So uh, we don't have kids either. So we have two dogs, which we love, Moe and Zoe, Chihuahua. And our other one is like, we did a DNA test. She's like 13 different breeds. It's just like the most mixed dog in the on planet earth she's so sweet though she's the best but um so we have our youth you know we have our youth and we have our freedom so uh, we all <laughs> like that was one of the main reasons why we even made this decision to embark on our own journeys was that was a huge part of it youth and freedom youth no kids and we're going to start a family you know family is part of our plans but if you have your body if you have your mind and if you have the ability to really not be encumbered by anything physical or by anything that you've sort of sunk your roots into, you know, right or wrong. I mean, there's a lot of beautiful things that you can make where you sunk, you know, you sink roots in and you're financially uh, independent or even financially dependent on a job, whatever it is, you can build a lot of beautiful things. But for us, having that freedom to really explore and just choose our own paths and discover what we jive with and what we don't is giant. It's giant and it becomes easier when you're younger, because I think that ultimately gives you just more time. You have more time to to embark on those journeys and do those things. Um, that doesn't mean that if you're in your 50s or 60s, that it's somehow any better or worse. Uh, I just think that when it comes from a standpoint of uh, maybe trying and maybe you have more opportunities to try and fail the younger you are. Um, but for us, that was a, that was a variable was that if we look back when we're in our 50s and 60s and we were to look back at where we are now at our youth, would we be um, kicking ourselves in the butt because we got this gift from the universe that we didn't capitalize on? And we both agreed that if we didn't capitalize on the gift that we got from the universe, that we would be idiots. And so we have to take the gift and figure out what the universe wants for us. And we're doing that now. And I feel like the luckiest person in the world every single day. And that's another thing that I've learned through this journey is that I've become much more thankful. I don't, I was, I don't think I was nearly enough. Uh, I wasn't nearly as thankful as I should have been even like a couple of years ago, to be honest. I think now I really understand what it means to be truly lucky and to truly have opportunities that few don't. And if you put my situation within the context of the entire global population, boy, am I fucking lucky. So. I, it's taught me a lot of thankfulness and yeah, it, it's been, and, and to do it at this age, it's just like puts a different sort of level of importance around it because it's crazy. It's unbelievable. It's nuts. With financial freedom comes choices, inflection points for someone like Elon Musk many years ago, after his big payday on from PayPal, he decided to start two companies, SpaceX and Tesla and work his brain off until today. Jeff Bezos is having a good life. There's no right or wrong. What is Farzad's master plan for the next five years? Man, <laughs> can I just give you props for the incredible questions, bro? Like you do such a good job. Shout out, seriously. Everybody clap at your computer. Just standing ovation for Darren. Well, seriously, like su such good questions. Um, I, I've been thinking about this quite a bit more lately. I, I think for the first uh, year after like for the first few months after I left Tesla, I I left it with the intention of like, I didn't have anything in mind. I just knew I had a lever I could pull that would embark me on a journey. And I decided to learn my way through that journey on what my next steps were. I think for me, what what's really starting to become more of a pull is I think the YouTube journey for me has given me uh, a sort of um, an appreciation for just how rewarding it is to have deep conversations with really smart people and to build a community that's a incredibly smart and incredibly kind, 
but they are all trying to make the future better, right? And so what, what I'm starting to become more attracted to is how can I use my platform or how can I build something that's going to help make the future better in some way with the skill sets and natural abilities that I have that could help humanity. And so the things I'm discovering is okay. So it turns out the people appreciate my interview style and they think I'm a good interviewer. Okay, cool. So maybe I could start leveraging that. Uh, you know, the folks out there think that um, I'm able to sort of bring people together and have very deep conversations and try to problem solve things. Okay, cool. That's yet another thing that I can sort of uh, use to build that future that I want. So I could see myself, I could see myself uh, building something around trying to problem solve for uh, a better future in some way. Either like we have a private discord at, on my channel. And like one of the things we like to say is that we, we have like a think tank of sorts. That's just open source. We just have an open source think think tank that's, you know, it's not paid for. You just go listen to the, you know, we have these long form community forum conversations and we're drilling down like crazy on these, like, like almost obscure topics. You know, it's part of the Tesla community, but it's like, we're really getting to like the super, like, like super deep layer of like, you know, what it means to, you know, in a world with full, uh, full self-driving and your cities are all, you know, configured specifically and you have tunnels and stuff. What are the business opportunities that could come up? Like, you know, like <laughs> some weird stuff. So that's fun. Trying to figure out the future is fun for me. And it's a fruitless endeavor sometimes because, you know, I've been told a lot of times, like, why be present and, you know, really focus on the now, which I agree with. That's also very healthy. But my brain naturally goes to the future and trying to figure out what the future looks like. So something around that. And it's not well formed to be complete. As you can tell by my answer, it's still very abstract, but I'm accepting that. You know, I, I don't think I don't think I have to know exactly what my mission needs to be for the next five years. All I know, I think what I'm starting to learn is that if there's a pool for you that is strong enough that it makes you really excited just go into it and if you feel discomfort doing it or if you feel like some imposter syndrome or that you're out of your league or that you're doing this like you shouldn't be doing this because you're not experienced enough or you somehow feel like you're not good enough for this you go into that extra hard because that's how you learn how to do it so and i'm feeling those two things i'm feeling a lot of attraction to it and i'm feeling like an imposter so that's where I need to go. And then the path will show itself after that. So um, we'll see. We'll see what happens. I think that's an exciting future. Yeah. A future that hope so. isn't always predictable. <laughs> there, there are risks. But then that's how yeah. you started in your life journey. When you first started investing in Tesla, there were no guarantees. Only that you, you've done your homework, you've done your research, you believe you had the skills, and you made a calculated decision. Sometimes it turns out well. Sometimes we learn and grow from it. Farzad, you right. are a big fan of Metallica and their music video for Nothing Else Matters just became their first to cross a billion views on YouTube. You yourself have a growing YouTube channel about 10 months in now, almost a year. And yep. for the audience, I recommend subscribing to get a unique perspective on Tesla because Farzad originally wanted to start a guitar cover YouTube channel, but he's doing this here talking about Tesla, about investing for the community, not just for himself, but for a lot more of us around the world. And I want to quote the, the lyrics from Nothing Else Matters. I say, I never opened myself this way. Life is ours. We live it our way. As far as I mentioned a few times earlier in this interview. All these words, I don't just say, and nothing else matters. And so far as I think what you're doing here is a really unique gift because of your perspective, for your passion, your skills. And the Tesla community is a better place because of you. Thank you for being here. My goodness. That's, <laughs> you made me cry. <laughs> that's very sweet. That, honestly, that's super sweet, man. Thank you so much. That's, I think, um, I really appreciate you saying that. And I, uh, I love the fact that you use nothing else matters, like <laughs> lyrics from the song, one of my all time favorites, uh, from them, but, um, you do, you do incredible work as well, man. I think you're the way you've approached, um, sort of telling the story of Tesla, especially in Singapore and, and trying to bring more awareness uh, from that perspective, but also how you view Tesla and its future potential. I could say the same thing about you and just thank you so much. You're an awesome person, dude. Like seriously, it's very clear that you're super awesome. You're just a good dude. 
and we're look, we're just lucky to have you. And I'm, I feel very honored to be able to sit down and talk to you, man. I, it's, it's, this is, has been a highlight for me. So thank you so much for uh, giving me the opportunity to speak with you. And uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Been a joy. It's been a pleasure. So if you found this video useful, please click the like button and hit subscribe to stay updated to more interviews like this. Take care, everyone. Like and subscribe. Like and subscribe. Hit it.